Barbecue is Native American in, at its foundation. And I think that gets glossed over. The typical barbecue history narrative talks about indigenous people in the Caribbean, but there's a lot of dots that don't get connected when we start, start talking about barbecue in the American South. How do we go from this raised platform in the Caribbean to this trench method in the American South? Because the trench method was not in the Caribbean, so something else is going on. Enslaved Native Americans were barbecue's first cooks, but because Indian slavery didn't work out, they transitioned to African slavery. And so then that's when enslaved Africans and then later enslaved African-Americans become barbecue's principal cooks. You know, a lot of people start the story with Henry Perry, but if you look at kind of uh, newspapers from the 1800s, it was clear that there were some barbecue events that were happening in that part of Kansas, uh, you know, as early as the 1870s, maybe even earlier. And in many cases, barbecue came with slavery. African-Americans emerged from slavery with a competitive advantage in barbecue. It was just understood that the very best barbecue was going to be made by an African-American. So that competitive advantage they leveraged into having what I called freelance barbecue gigs around the country. And then when we go to this shift from kind of rural barbecue to urban barbecue where you need more capital in order to have a barbecue business. And one of the long-standing problems for African-Americans back then and even today is access to capital and freedom from other people to just you know start their business where they want to and grow their business how they want to. Of course, we couldn't, you, at that time, you didn't borrow money from the banks. You had vendor operators that were run by the vendor operating companies. So we borrowed the money from the jukebox vendor man, and he, he was only dead enough money to buy and took the payment out of the jukebox that was in the place at the time. So that's how we got started, with a $500 jukebox loan, and a lot of determination. And the thing that really surprised me is how uh, the way that Native Americans have been erased from the barbecue narrative is a template for what's happening to African Americans now. When white Europeans come to the American South and they see Native Americans cooking a certain way, they all call it barbecue. But then within 150 years, whatever Native Americans were doing is not barbecue anymore. What white barbecuers are doing is more and more being called the norm. And the best example of this is sauce. Um, you'll hear people say, oh yeah, real barbecue doesn't have sauce. African Americans will be like, say, well, who says? Sauce is integral to African American barbecue culture. So because the drumbeat of what barbecue is, is being narrowed and narrowed, everything else is being pushed to the margins. Now, I, I, I criticize the American Royal for not being diverse in terms of its barbecue hall of fame. And uh, to their credit, they invited me on the board. And so the last two years, and it's not all me, I'm working with other board members who are like-minded. So we're, we're getting more diverse classes inducted to the Barbecue Hall of Fame. And I'm proud to say the, the very first African-American woman was inducted just this past year, but Desiree Robinson of Cozy Corner in Memphis. And there's just so many other people who need to get a shout out. So, you know, my, my thing is I'm just trying to remind people of the significant contributions that African-Americans have made to barbecue culture, something that's been lost the last couple of decades. Can somebody eat my food? I get a joy out of that. I smile about that, you know? Especially if you think they're enjoying it. Yeah. And most of the time I get good compliments on it. Yeah. That always makes my day, I tell them. And it does, yeah. <laughs>